everyone. Uh, today, I wanted to share a little bit about my career, to give you some tips on how to navigate careers in male-dominated fields. Um, right off the bat, I'm going to share a story with you with some actionable information. And the important thing is when you see inequities, you've got to speak up and call them out. I was sitting in a meeting um, and the FCC's engineering office, and we had finished the meeting, and this was a, a, a while ago, we had finished the meeting topic and everyone got up to leave. And the men kept talking about the meeting topic on the way to the men's room. And so I said to all these gentlemen who were my colleagues, I said, I'm going to follow you. And I started to do so, follow you into the men's room if you're going to continue to talk about the meeting topic and stand next to you at the urinal. Well, everybody burst out laughing. Um, but the important thing was, is they never did that again. And You've got to be bold and be creative when fighting for your seat at the table and use humor. I'm sure many of you have had to fight to get your seat at the table. You might be the only woman in a meeting with all men in your company or uh, the first woman to serve in a role. We have all been there. So what do I mean by male dominated? Um, here are some factoids. When I was an undergraduate engineer, there were 5% women in my major. Um, that was 30 years ago. Now they're only 9%. I had my first female boss when I was 40. And unfortunately, the benchmarks just continue today. Of the 10 biggest companies nationwide, only one has a woman serving as their CISO, the top cybersecurity uh, executive, and that's CBS Health. Of the eight biggest companies in my tech trade association, every household name you could imagine, only a handful have women like me as their heads of global public policy. And I don't even have an inherently technical role. So here are a couple of my big lessons learned. You know, there are going to be ongoing challenges, both from within yourself and outside. You know, from within, I have to say, I've been an obstacle to myself. I've always had a challenge speaking up in meetings. I've often been silent and foregone my opportunities to participate. Sometimes I felt like, geez, you know, I, 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 I was too polite. So what did I have to do? I had to get in touch with my inner New Jersey native pushy self and intentionally speak at the meetings I was at. Um, and the key is to recognize the obstacles within yourself that might be creating um, issues and eliminate them. Um, I'm not going to say that this is going to happen overnight. I still struggle. Um, I was at a corporate board education seminar. Um, it was held by one of the big accounting firms with members of um, audit committees from all sorts of different companies. And we had a case study we were discussing at a bunch of different tables. And I was discussing it with the folks at my table um, and typically on audit committees, very hefty, heavy duty financial types. And I had a few insights to share on the case study. Well, after all the groups had discussed, um, the conference organizers were soliciting input. And a gentleman at my table uh, stood up and shared the insights that I had given at our uh, in table discussion. Now, he didn't take credit for them. He just said these were the ones that you know we talked about at the table. But I didn't have the courage to stand up myself to share and say them. And this guy had the room with those insights, which were mine. 
So I'm not going to say it's going to happen overnight, but just see through the struggle and try not to be your own naysayer. There are going to be obstacles from outside. There are going to be naysayers. Other people are going to be obstacles. You've got to figure out how to get around those obstacles. I'll tell you the story of my first engineering job. I was one of the first women in management in a network engineering organization. And I was routinely told that I was taking a job away from a man who needed it to support his family. Like I didn't need mine to support my own family. Or that I was there simply because of a diversity requirement. Well, I just felt terrible. I had strived so hard to get there and I wanted to be invisible, but I'm five foot 10 and six feet in heels. And wherever I go, I stand out. And so how did I navigate around that? Well, I convinced that employer that getting a law degree would help me do my engineering job. And I went to Georgetown at night and somebody with a law degree at that company would come in three levels higher than those men who were telling me I didn't belong there. Now, I ended up doing something else after law school graduation, but that's how I navigated around that one. Now, it's interesting to note, um, it's not just the naysayers who create obstacles in careers. It's also well-intentioned cheerleaders who create obstacles. One of my biggest pet peeves is the all too common shunting of talented women into chiefs of staff roles rather than into line management roles or roles with P&L responsibility. I think the ironic thing is that women often get these roles because they're multi-talented. You know, they're great at doing external presentations. They're great at briefing the board that they get into these slotted, into these chiefs of staff roles that have limited opportunity for growth. And for example, for board work down the road. This happened to me. Um, I, in the, um, I was a leading female leader uh, in, in an organization. Uh, this was also um, the FCC in an engineering organization. I had delivered on high stakes, high profile issues for several years. And I approached my boss, who was then the chief engineer. And I said, you know, I really want a promotion. I think I could contribute to the organization. I want to grow. I want to be deputy chief of the office you know, a position that would be on a path to lead to ultimately be head of a department. So um, he said to me, you know, Lauren, you know, I, I you know, I love you, but I, um, this is going to ruffle too many feathers. I, you need to be chief of staff. And I said, chief of staff is really not what I was looking for. So I, I said, turn him down. I said, I don't, I don't want to be chief of staff. It's not going to lead me anywhere. And I, um, I started looking for a job and um, uh, found one miraculously in two weeks outside the agency. So I went back to my boss, the chief engineer, and I said, listen, I, I, I got a job, so I'm going to be leaving. And my boss was shocked and he really didn't want me to leave. So he said, of course, Lauren, you, you can be my deputy. I'll, I just need to get the approval from the chief of staff of the agency. And so he went and talked to the chief of staff of the agency and the chief of staff said, she's not technical enough, whatever that means. And he overruled the chief engineer of the agency. And so not too long after that, I left for a very nice private sector job. So my takeaway from this is that even if you firmly believe you are helping someone, like my boss believed he was helping me by giving me that chief of staff role. You know, are you being rigorous and thoughtful about what you are doing? You know, are you giving someone a seat at the table as I would have had had I been deputy of the organization? Or are you merely giving them a role that's going to make them have to set that table for others as the chief of staff role in that organization would have been? You know, ask the question of yourself, is it really the best thing for them 
or am I doing what's easiest for me? I've tried to uh, strive to manage in this way, and I've even recommended to the rock stars who've worked for me other jobs outside the organization, and it's amazing how much loyalty that inspires. As I mentioned, it's important to speak up when you see inequities, and how you do so effectively depends on the situation. I started this talk with a funny story about following the men in my office into the men's room. And that's where I used humor to point out inequities. But there are a lot of ways to point out inequities and you need to use the right tool for the circumstances. I was recently in a, in a board meeting with a nonprofit board I'm on and we were talking about new candidates for the board and we were talking about a female candidate incredible leader. Everybody was saying amazing things, singing her praises. And then someone at the end, another director said, I'm really worried about how much work she's taken on. I don't know if she has the bandwidth for this and whatever. Well, I let it go. And we continued to talk about the other candidates. But at the end of the candidate discussion, I circled back and I said, you know, if just as everyone unanimously agreed that this woman had the leadership skills to take on this board of director role, they should trust in the fact that she knows how to manage her own bandwidth. And everyone agreed. And uh, so I think it's important they weren't trying to be intentionally discriminatory, but it was kind of an unintentional bias uh, being applied. Well, so in closing, I'd like to talk a bit about some of the wonderful opportunities that being in a technical career has shown me. We've talked about some of the challenges, but what are the opportunities with taking this road that's less taken? Um, I started engineering school, and I hate to admit this, more than 30 years ago. And like many female engineering students of my time, my dad, a PhD engineer, um, really urged me to pursue an engineering degree. He said that with an engineering degree, I would garner the analytic skills, the rigorous analytical skills to approach problem solving regardless of what career I ultimately pursued. And he said, I wasn't likely to pick up an engineering textbook and read it for fun. And as much as any teenager, I didn't want to admit my dad was right, um, he was. And it's been taking that road less traveled that's made all the difference in my career. Even after pursuing a law degree, there have been countless times when having an engineering undergraduate degree has proven invaluable. I was a stay-at-home mom for six years, and my re-entry employer was able to overlook my gap in work history because I was someone who could speak the language of law and technology. And I've gotten some really cool jobs, like at the White House, because I had those skills. I've worked at the intersection of law, technology, and policy all of this time, and worked at some of the most incredible technological transformation of the last 25 years. I negotiated to get the initial tranche of frequencies from the, for cellular from the Department of Defense for 3G. Now we're talking about 5G. I helped advocate for policies that enabled Wi-Fi around the world. And at the White House, I worked on the 2013 Cybersecurity Presidential Executive Order one of the biggest federal policy initiatives aimed at establishing baseline cybersecurity standards across all industries. And I got on my first corporate board seat because of my technology background. It's at ASEA. I head up the regulatory committee and with my cyber background, they wanted me on audit. audit. And ASEA is doing amazing stuff. It's wireless power. So using those same cellular type frequencies to transmit power. And it's very exciting. And of course, I'm the first female on their board of directors. 
for many years, I was under the mistaken impression that my presence alone in the career would show that women belong there. And, and, and it didn't make that statement enough. I wasn't doing enough to make the path easier for the next generation of technologists. So now I'm even more intentional. When I worked at the White House, I began doing public speaking to evangelize for more women in STEM fields. And now I'm on the board of the Akamai Foundation, which provides support for programs to increase the STEM pipeline for women and underrepresented minorities. As the first female director on my board, I'm trying to lead by example. I've transitioned from an unintentional pioneer as a female leader in technology to an intentional advocate for change. Thank you. Lauren, thank you so much. Just a second ago, I was listening to you just thinking, oh, Lauren. <laughs> so much of what you were saying was just so fantastic and so kind of from the heart. And we do have some questions that popped up and I'm, we have two minutes here. So I'm going to ask you quickly while we still have you up here. Um, can you give us an example of how you've handled unconscious bias? Yes. Well, I, I, you know, I think the example in the boardroom, I mean, now I'm senior enough. So I'm, I'm able to steer the conversation. And I think you need to, one thing is to find other advocates uh, who also might feel the same way. And sometimes you can kind of play off each other. And if you know a situation is going to come up in advance, pre-talk that out and kind of have that planned. Or, you know, I, you know, I know there are certain boards, I walk in the room and I know I've got one or two people who are going to echo and really amplify by echoing whatever I say in that regard. And I think it's important to find those people who are cheerleaders for the same issues. So I guess that's, you know, one piece of actionable advice. Yeah, I think that's great. And maybe that leads us right to this second question with our last minute here, which is what resources and support systems are available for women in tech who are maybe struggling to speak up or assert themselves? Do you know of any resources, Lauren? Yeah, I mean, I think all of the certifying organizations have um, programs on this set of issues. I mean, frankly, that's one of the reasons I, I do this, because I want women to know you're not alone. <laughs> you might think you're alone, but you're not alone. And I, and I think that's kind of a starting point. But I think um, some of the professional organizations have programming in this area. And also the ERGs, um, the employee resource groups in corporations. I think there's a lot of good support there as well. Wonderful. Thank you so much. We are right on the nose of timing here, Lauren, so we will let you go. But thank you again and clearly resonated with many people with those questions that were coming through. Um, we appreciate you sharing your story here with us on this stage. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thanks, Lauren.